we're looking at the book of 1 Corinthians, and we're finding out it's a really complicated thing to work through, not because that it has complicated concepts. The concepts of grace and the gospel are simple, but when we try to apply them to our complicated lives, that's when we start running into challenges. And so last week we talked about just how we understand the concept of grace is very challenging. This week we're going to talk about some other concepts, and we are in First or Corinthians, the second chapter, and this is what it says. And so it was with me, brothers and sisters. When I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. He's challenging his culture because this is not looked up to in the culture of Corinth. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. There, unfortunately, there are some people who have uh, misunderstood this passage, and so they think that preaching is supposed to be poor so that then we can prove that anything good that comes out of it must have been God. That's not what he's saying. We'll talk a little bit more, more about that in a minute. So that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom a mystery that has been hidden and that God designed it for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught us by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, also a misunderstood passage, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. It's the season for commencements and graduations and speeches. A former president of the United States, John Kennedy, once said this at a commencement celebration. The great enemy of truth is very often not the lie deliberate, contrived, and dishonest. But the myth, persistent, persuasive, and unrealistic. Too often we hold fast to the cliches of our forebears. We subject all the facts to a prefabricated set of interpretations. We enjoy the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. Opinions, we've all got them. Here's a question for you. By the way, don't raise your hand or look knowingly in any way because it might bite you. Uh, have you had an opinion change in the last 10 years? Because if you haven't, I can only think of two reasons. One is that you were always right, and you and God own that corner of the market. That is unlikely. And the other is that you haven't learned anything. And in our culture, with all that we have available to us, it's astonishing how little we can learn while we are very distracted and very busy. But if you have changed your opinion about something, what caused that change? 
Why did you actually shift from thinking one way about something to another way about it? Was it a personal experience? Because sometimes that will change our opinion. Was it a different information that came to you, maybe better information? Was it a friend who exposed you to something else? Was it a convincing presentation by an influential person? You see, in our world, we focus on opinions, but we have trouble telling the difference between opinion and truth. And uh, in our world, everyone has an opinion but not everyone speaks the truth. So some people have an opinion about God. How do they know that's true? Is your opinion about God the same thing as knowing God? And the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Corinthians begins to cut down this concept and bring it to its knees. And he says, just because we are freely able to say things doesn't mean that the things that we say are always true. Just think about it. If you believe something is true, why do you believe it? What convinced you that that's not just an opinion, that that's not just someone's interpretation, that it's actually true? And the reason this was so important to Paul in his letter to the church at Corinth was because in that culture they worshipped knowledge and they worshipped wisdom. They had great wealth and that was a source of power. And they also understood that knowledge was a source of power. And so they were adamant about learning more all the time. And so they had lots of teachers. But the teachers weren't really so much about trying to bring you to truth as about trying to get you to think what a great teacher they were. And so they had these great techniques and ways to manipulate an audience to get an applause, but not necessarily to change lives. And this was a challenge for the Apostle Paul. In fact, uh, Paul is not the only one to notice this. There was an historian, his name was Quintilian. He lived at the same time of Paul. He was a contemporary. And this is what he wrote in his book. He said about the teachers at Corinth, teachers seek to obtain the reputation of speaking with greater vigor than the trained orator by means of delivery. For they should on all and every occasion bellow their every utterances with uplifted hand, dashing this way and that, panting, gesticulating wildly, wagging their heads with all the frenzy of a lunatic. Smite your hands together, stamp the ground, slap your thigh, your breast, your forehead, and you will go straight to the heart of the dingier members of the audience. Ooh. Paul embarrassed the Corinthian believers because his delivery was not about trying to manipulate a crowd to get a reaction. Success for him was not that everybody stood up and applauded when his message was done. Success for him is that when people left, their lives were changed. And this was a very different, it was a countercultural concept for the Corinthian believers. So Paul's delivery was unusual, but the knowledge and the wisdom that he's talking about are also unusual. He wasn't trying to get people to think that he was great when he was done, but that God was great when he was done. Just like the Corinthians misunderstood the concept of grace, they misunderstood concepts of wisdom and knowledge and spirituality. And so Paul is not suggesting in this passage that you must preach poorly and then that's how you know that uh, uh, God is present because anything that good comes out of it must come from him. He's just simply saying he will not rely on the clever devices used by the public speakers in Corinth to become famous. That's not what he's after. He also talks about, being, about the wisdom of this world coming to nothing. And there are some people in Christianity that have viewed passages like this as though that Christianity is an anti-intellectual approach to life. And what I want you to know this morning, in case you haven't heard this before, and I'm sure that you have, but I will just risk being redundant, you are not required to check your brains at the door to believe in what Christ accomplished at the cross of Calvary. Aren't you glad that God gave you a brain and encourages you to use it? Why don't you just poke somebody next to you, smile when you say it, and say, use your brains. Use your brains. (laughs) 
In fact, lots of people out of their own intellectual pursuits have actually wound up being exposed to information that made them start thinking about God. And we have, it seems like, an endless supply of information in our culture. We've got research institutions that are constantly putting out cutting edge and breathtaking information. We have more data than we can possibly imagine available in our world. And some Christians have actually taken a position of being contrary or opposed to any scientific pursuit. And first of all, what I would tell you is that the, the concepts of scientific pursuit actually came out of theology. The, the way people learn to ask questions about God, people began to ask about other things, and the result was they began to learn how our world worked. The sciences and philosophy are a way to steward and to cultivate the world that God has given to us. So, for example, if you are working in finance, medicine, engineering, microbiology, philosophy, mathematics, education, any of those other fields, you should know that these are God glorifying pursuits. We're learning how the world he's given to us works. God doesn't expect us to be in ignorance about those things. But Paul does warn us with a very important concept, and that is this. The knowledge of this world has limits. He doesn't say it's bad. He just says it's limited. So we have to understand this. Well, what are the limits of the knowledge of this world? And the first one he addresses is time time. Did you catch it when we looked at verses 6 and 7? It said, we do not speak the message of the wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this world or the age of the rulers of this age who are coming to, what's the next word? Nothing. The, the wisdom of this world is coming to nothing. And then he goes on to say, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God designed for our glory before time began. He actually suggests that there's wisdom that didn't start when our time began, and it will, it will uh, last much longer than when our time ends. Now, if you were to go uh, to Washington, D.C., and to the Library of Congress, uh, you would be told that there are over 18 million books in the Library of Congress right now, and they're adding 200,000 books every single year. And uh, so, if, if, if you, how many have read all of those books? Of course not. And if you were a person who loves to read, you read voraciously. You read every day. You read in a disciplined way. You were to read every single day. In your lifetime, you could read about 2,600 books, which means for every book you're choosing, there are hundreds of thousands you are ignoring. So let me ask you a question. When was the last time you read a book you didn't want to read? Now, if you're a student, you're going, all the time. They assign me stuff. I don't like this, but I've got a test. I've got to write a paper. I... But you know what? Once we get out of our scholastic and academic pursuits, it's astonishing how rarely we will ever read anything we don't want to. We have to like the genre. We have to like the author. We have to like the topic. We even have to like their position. One thing our culture does horribly, we only read and listen to people who already agree with us. And here's the funniest thing in the world. You will never learn a new thing by repeating what you already know. It's just not how the world works. So why don't we read all of these books? Because we don't have the time. We don't have the time. And not only will we not have the time to access all of this, but there's another influence of time on this, and that is that some of this information becomes outdated. It actually expires. It's no longer usable over time. So Paul says some of the wisdom of our world is limited by time. There's another limitation, and that's the limit of our senses. The limit of our senses. He talks about this in verse 9. He says, it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived. We have our senses. He's actually referring, he's quoting the prophet Isaiah here. And what he's telling us is that there are some things that are beyond our reach to be able to sense. We, we have the, our five senses. There's just some things that are beyond our five senses. It would be silly for us to presume that the only thing that can exist is what we can actually perceive. 
with our senses. C.S. Lewis actually talked about this, and he said, you know, a plant can perceive a, a, a sunlight. There's a whole process called photosynthesis. And sometimes, if, you, if you've got plants in your house, sometimes they'll even bend themselves a little bit towards the sun. How many have seen plants do that? It's kind of a cool thing. But how many know that if you give the plant ice cream, it's completely lost on them? <laughs> they have no way to taste it. They have no way to smell it. They just, they can enjoy it. How foolish would it be for the plant to think that it understands everything there is in the universe because it can process sunlight. And how foolish we would be to think that everything we can process, everything we can smell, everything we can touch, everything we can hear, everything we can taste, everything we can see, that this is all there is. Paul says that that's a, there's more to this universe than what our senses tell us. And only God can produce a spiritual work in our heart to help us understand something beyond our senses. The third thing he tells us is a limitation is access. We have a limitation of access. He talks about this in the 11th verse. He says, For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God because, except the spirit of God. How many know you can't actually get into God's head? There are some people, I've met them, there are some people who think everything they think is from God, but how many know that's not true? How many know you are capable of having a thought that wasn't from God? How many suspect that many of your thoughts are actually not from God? Yeah, that's how that works. You can't really know someone better than you can know yourself. You can read an autobiography of someone, but you can only know them as well as they were willing to be candid. You only know what they tell you. Our knowledge of someone might be impressive, but it's not comprehensive. And this is what Paul is telling us. You can't really know someone impersonally. Something else has to happen. See, God's knowledge and wisdom, it's not limited by time. It, it, it precedes humans, and it will go beyond any institution or organization we ever build. And God's knowledge and wisdom is not limited to our senses. It's beyond what we have seen or heard or feel. But he does tell us that we can know him, that we, it's not just knowing about him, but actually knowing him. And this is what he wants us to know, is that the only way to know God is to know him personally, to know him personally. Now, this seemed impossible to the citizens of Corinth. And by the way, I think it seems unlikely to us, too. It is easier for us to keep our distance from God. We feel safer if he's just a detached, impersonal force. For some people, God is nothing more than a decision that they make. Either they believe in him or they don't believe in him. But they don't think of him as a person that they have a relationship with. Knowing about God is not the same thing as knowing God. Having an opinion about God is not the same thing as knowing God. Anybody take a, a, a language in, in high school? Anybody? Yeah, what did you take? Spanish. Anybody else? Yes? Latin and French. French. Anybody else? German. How many of you would consider yourself fluent in those languages? We're not because memorizing vocabulary is not the same thing as being fluent in a language. Or let's say this. Let's suppose you, ha you are in need of a very delicate heart procedure. And they tell you that the person who's going to do this procedure on you today has actually never done this procedure before, but he did get an A on the test. <laughs> about the How many? That's not enough for you. You want someone who doesn't just know about the procedure, they know the procedure. This is an important concept because for us, a lot of people know about God, but they're not fluent in God. A lot of people know about God, but they don't have an experience with God. And it's not the same thing. 
You cannot understand God until you get to know God. And our world keeps trying to put this in reverse. We want to understand him first, and then we'll get to know him. And Paul tells the church at Corinth that's not how it works. By the way, it's not how it works with anybody else either. You get to understand someone after you get to know them. That's how it works. Your opinion about God is not the same thing as actually knowing him. Uh, let's use a little illustration here. Does anyone else like ice cream besides me? Or am I the only ice cream person in the house? In our house, ice cream is a vitamin, and we try to get our vitamin every single day. I was just at a meal. It was, a, it was way too much food to eat, and we were out with some friends, and, and they said, would you like some desserts? And I said, oh, no, I, I am too full. And they said, it's ice cream. I said, well, just a little bit. Uh, we'll, we'll find some space for that. So, so let's suppose, let's suppose that you've never experienced chocolate syrup before. You don't know what it is. You've never seen it. You've never tasted it. It's completely unknown to you. How many think that would be a sad thing that someone would not know what that is? And someone explains it. Oh, it's so good. It's dark. It's delicious. It's so sweet. And you could watch that. If you've never seen it before, it, it might look like mud to you. What is that? It looks like oil. What are they putting on my ice cream? You're ruining it. And here's the thing. You can know because you have read it that it is sweet. But that is not the same thing as having tasted it. And this is how it shows up differently. Once you've tasted chocolate syrup on ice cream, the next time you see somebody pouring chocolate syrup on ice cream, you get a little happy inside. A smile comes up. You start anticipating. You want to move towards pleasure starts happening even before you get to the actual eating of it. Why? Because now you know chocolate syrup. There are people who know about God, but there's no pleasure in serving him or in worshiping him. They know it's something they're supposed to do. They've been taught it. They believe it. They've accepted it as a fact. They even have an opinion about it. But when they talk about worshiping, there's no sense of joy. There's no pleasure. There's not a smile that comes to their heart because they know they're going to be in relationship with their Heavenly Father. It's, they know about God, but they don't know God. And you know what? There are people in this room right now. You know about God. You know a lot about God. But the question is, do you know him? That's the challenge. So the Apostle Paul is challenging those believers at Corinth, but he's not dismissing them. He's just wanting to help them understand a new thing in a new way. He's challenging their concepts of love and power by talking about his own weakness. This is not something they're used to. It seems foolish to them that the ultimate powerful God would humble himself, take on the form of a servant, and die on a cross for people who don't even think they need to be rescued. That seems like complete foolishness to them. And yet Paul says, once you know God, it makes sense. You understand it. He's not just a detached force. So how can we know God if we cannot enter his world? Because we can't. And the good news is because he entered ours. We can't know him because we can enlighten ourselves to the point of that experience. We know him because he descended into our experience. We don't transcend our limits. He came to us. He's the one who initiated grace. So how does this whole process work? If he's beyond our senses, if all of this is beyond our senses, how do we actually learn this? And he tells us this. He says that God helps us know him through his spirit. And this is really interesting. Up to this point in the letter, the Apostle Paul has only used the term spirit one time. But in the verses 10 through 14, he will use the term the spirit six times. And he's telling us, that we actually can gain the mind of Christ. He's not saying that all of your thoughts are Christ's thoughts. What he's saying is, is that the Holy Spirit actually helps us develop a new perspective. 
and we start seeing God differently, we start seeing ourselves differently, we start seeing our friends and family differently, we see our world differently, because now the Holy Spirit is going beyond what our eyes can see and showing us things, beyond what our ears can hear and teaching us things, beyond what we can imagine with our own hearts, and he's giving us imaginations beyond what we are capable of. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. You can look at Jesus. You can analyze him. You can ask questions about him, but that you won't get the answers that you need until you actually engage life with him. And here's the amazing thing. God did not require us to enter his world. He came to ours. He has not come to make us afraid. He's come to give us hope. He's not come to add burdens to our life. He's come to relieve and release us from the horrible burden of self-centeredness. This is the God you can know. Let's bow our heads this morning. Once you know this God who came into our world and humbled himself to the point of death for us, once you've experienced this, you actually experience a change in your identity. You're no longer identified by what you've acquired or what you've obtained or what you've accomplished. You're no longer identified by the people who are around you the place that you work or the place you go to school, all of those are wonderful gifts, but your identity is not in them. Your identity is in the God who loved you so much. He would give his one and only son for you. He would give his one and only life for you. And once you actually begin to experience that, it changes everything. So, Father... We're grateful for all we can learn about you. But we have to be honest today. It's not enough. We want to know you. We don't just want to have opinions, even informed opinions about you. We want to know you. So by your spirit, begin to work something deep within us so that our information about you is not limited just to the things that we've read or that we've heard, but our information about you is because we have spent time with you. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning?